Hi everyone, my name uh, welcome to another one of the APSA interactive section of number year of 2023-2024 academic year. So we are pleased to host tonight's section with the program director to answer any general question about the interview. So now, first and foremost, I would now to have our wonderful panelists to introduce about themselves and to be more efficient with the time I will call each of the panelists by name. So first I have Dr. Shuti. Hi, I'm Brian Schutte. I am the co-director of the DO PhD program at the Michigan State University College of Osteopathic Medicine. And uh, I am an associate professor in microbiology and molecular genetics. And my lab does research in craniofacial genetics. Uh, next, I have Dr. Uh, Reiner. Uh, my name is Steve Reiner. I'm the director of Columbia's MD PhD program. I'm an MD who um, was trained in uh, internal medicine and infectious diseases, and my research is on um, T cells uh, and immune responses to infection and cancer. Thank you, Dr. Reiner. Uh, next, I have Dr. Yu. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, JP Yu. I'm the Senior Associate Director of the University of Wisconsin MSTP. Uh, I am an Assistant Professor of Radiology in the Division of Neuroradiology. Uh, my lab studies uh, biological correlates of MRI. Thank you, Dr. Yu. Next, I have Dr. Liu. Hi, everyone. My name is Andrea Liu. I am the Assistant Dean of Admissions at uh, Duke School of Medicine, and I'm the Assistant Director of the MD-PhD program here at Duke as well. Thank you, Dr. Liu. And lastly, I have Dr. Quignon. Oh, you're muted, Dr. Quignon. Of course I am. Uh, take two, Kathy Quignon is with the Emory MD-PhD program. I'm, I'm one of the co-directors. I primarily focus on, on student affairs, so I work in admissions as well. And my focus really is um, student development. Thank you so much, Dr. Quignon. And once again, thank you to our panelists. I must, uh, thank you so much for on being here. We are so grateful to have you to took the time out of your busy schedule today to come virtually to the meeting with us and to provide your wisdom with one of the to an, anyone who applied to the dual degree program interview. And first and foremost, first and foremost, my name is Min. I will be the moderator for this evening. I'm the postback student uh, and going to apply for my MD PhD next year. In the chat box right here, we will have to we will have Eli Wisdom who is the MD PhD student uh, we have moderating the chat, box, uh, the chat box today and also our volunteer live tweeting will be Kyle got, um, and VK will be helping from the public relations committee will be helping us today as well. And for those who are going to step away from the webinar as a reminder that, as a reminder that we will have the webinar record uh, recorded so you if you are busy you can come back watching the webinar later on if you have any question it's only available on our youtube channel as well as as a moderator i want to remind you to please submit all of your question to the q a box so we have already some of received some of the pre-submitted questions during the registration process we also have the team of co-moderator behind the scenes to collecting all of the questions for to answer live so if you have any question again put into the q a chat box and we'll try our best to address all of that question as much as, as we can. Um, I think that all of the announcements I have for now and thank you again for all for being here. So I will go ahead and start with the first question. So so let's see from the first question. Um, what what questions should I expect in an MD or in an MD PhD, PhD interview? Any panelists can take on this. All right. Well, is anyone? Oh, Steve, Mr. Ray. Um, it, it, I, I can start. You'll, you'll definitely get questions about your prior research experience. Um, often, um, it's the icebreaker that begins the interview, where uh, the interviewer may ask you to talk about one of your prior research experiences. Um, they're looking for uh, a gauge as to whether you have depth in your understanding of your research and how, how you 
treat you know the research in terms of what you're looking for in your career. So they're looking for your seriousness and your maturity and and the fact that you've had some depth of research experience. There are other questions too, but that, that, that I'll just break the ice with that. <laughs> research, research is one of the keys. That's certainly the first question you'll get from our program. And, um, and, and I will echo that we look for depth over breadth. We don't wanna know about you know, all six of the you know experiences that you had at, at at various summer programs, we really want to know about that one um, project where you have ownership, and and you can really talk you know A to Z about it from from the hypothesis to the outcome. Yeah, and to that I would add, as you practice. Uh, your interviews, which is perfectly fine, you're 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 allowed and encouraged to practice. Know that your interviewers are not experts. I mean, there a lot of them, if not all, are going to be PhDs or MD PhDs, but that doesn't mean that they're necessarily experts in the area that you have have or are becoming an expert in. So make sure that yes, you can talk about things at a very high level, but be prepared to to move up and down. And and a way to do that is that when you're practicing about interviewing. Uh, and talking about your research, talk to people who both are experts in the field so they can really hit you hard. <laughs> but also talk to people that don't necessarily understand 80% of what you're saying because that is going to force you to have the language and the and the, the, and the comparison and the, and the metaphors to say like, oh, well, what happens is this and it's like this. And and those are very good ways to, to test yourselves or have others test yourself on how well you truly understand the language uh, of, of your field, but also how you can communicate those ideas. I, I would echo that. Also, go ahead. Well, I was going to say that's very important. In fact, sometimes I will ask the uh, the interviewee if they could explain their project to me in a manner that could be understood by an intelligent high school student, because their ability to express something very you know technical in a way that anyone could understand is a very important gauge of like how good their communication skills are and some some other you know facets of their intellect. Yeah, I was just gonna add that in addition to just knowing your research, there's two other questions that we like to hear about at Duke. And one is, you know, why uh, do you wanna go into medical school as well? What's important about taking care of patients and others? So that's an important thing to be thinking about and having an answer to, and maybe even an experience that you've had uh, interacting with a patient would be helpful. And then sometimes we also ask questions about failure because science is a lot about failure and how do you how do you handle failure? Because it's, there's going to be a lot of that in uh, your PhD research and making sure that you're gonna be able to um, handle all those ups and downs along the way as well. And as you put together your, your application thing, Brian and Steve both hit on this too. At least here at Wisconsin, what we're really interested in is the is the really long, meaningful, longitudinal research experience that you've had. I would much rather see an applicant with one research experience that was over three years than another student with six different research experiences that were each two months. Because to what Andrew was talking about, we need to see you succeed we need to see you totally fail. And we need to see you fail again, fail again, fail again. And then finally that Western got fixed or that chip assay worked and then you succeeded. And so to, to see that and to hear you communicate that story and that's exactly what Kathy was also talking about was can you communicate that to me in 45 to 60 seconds? Can you explain it at the level where your mom who is not you know, a molecular immunologist could also understand it? That is also really important. So communication and longitudinal experiences and how you communicate and share those with us are very important. Um, I agree with that completely. One, one thing I'll say is a word of caution because this has been a hot topic amongst the, you know, the, the leadership of the, you know, MD PhD programs at the national level. If you haven't had a three-year experience, it, it may not be the case that you need to take gap years in order to get that experience. And so if you've had a, uh, a, a meaningful research experience that was only one year or it was only one summer, but you really could take ownership of it, that could be sufficient. So I just didn't, didn't want people to take that to its logical extreme that, 
oh boy, that means I need two years of gap. Because we would actually like to see as many people as possible get on with the show if they could, because it's a long, because it's a long journey. I'd like to add too that um, being in a college of osteopathic medicine, uh, we're somewhat of an outlier. And so our um, interviewers are going to definitely ask you about your, your interest in osteopathic medicine um, and, and why you are uh, choosing that path. Thank you so much. Oh, Dr. Ryan, did you want to say something? <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you to our panel. So the next question is on the Q&A chat box. So uh, one student asking, when you apply for the an MD, PhD program, do we have already have to know what we want to do for research or can we do, can we find out as we, as we go to other process? It's a really good question because um, the short answer is you don't have to know, but by the same token, you have to be able to explain why you have interest in something, like why what you did before interested you or what you would like to do next interests you. But by the same token, we, we all know that many of our students change their mind about the field of research from the time they did their interview till the time they begin you know, their PhD part of, part of their dual degree and things. So it's kind of a, you know, you, you, don't, you don't necessarily have to have commitment to this or that, but again, as part of the maturity process and knowing what you're getting yourself into, you certainly have to be able to express interest in a certain field or a certain you know, type of investigation. To that I would, oh, sorry. Go ahead. To, to that, I would say it's really about the story, right? I think communicating science, and again, this is just going back to the idea of communication, we're humans, we're naturally really attracted to stories. Tell me the story of your research. And if you come in and you say that, you know, I was doing molecular immunology, I was looking at tumor microenvironment and cancer immunotherapy, but now I want to do medical anthropology for my PhD. Okay, but tell me why and tell me how you got there. Support why that pivot's going to happen and why that's important to you. Um, and for us, that's okay, as long as the story makes sense. If you're making drastic orthogonal changes in your research direction, you can't tell me why or support why. To me, that's sort of a red flag because you're not being thoughtful about it. You're kind of just hop, you know, hopscotching all over the place. And that makes me worried as somebody who's going to be here, you know, your program director for eight, nine years. Yeah. And I think you also need to look at the different programs and look at the websites and see how the application is put together and constructed. Um, I mean, full disclosure, our, our application, you, you will be screened by PhD recruiters to our PhD programs. Does that mean that you're locked into that program forever and ever? No, but those are the people you're interviewing with and they're looking at your background, they're looking at the letters in your package and they're basically comparing you to, to other PhD students that are starting as first year students. So, so that's that's kind of their, their baseline. Uh, and they understand again that you may not choose to necessarily work with them, even though you asked to interview with them, but but that you are putting in quote unquote a good show. I mean, you're showing up as as good as any other first year PhD student that that they're interviewing. And later on, if if your experiences during the program lead you in a different direction, you talk to your program directors and you that's your first step. Go like, hey, I'm suddenly leaning in this area. What are my options? How could that happen? And they can help guide you both uh, developmentally, but also administratively in terms of how you can get potentially admitted to another program, because that program may, it could be that there's one program that is like, oh, you're an MD-PhD program. We love you. I'm a student. We love MD-PhD students. Come on in. And another one may be like, mm, well, you have to fill out the application because it wouldn't be fair to our other candidates. So, so definitely, uh, you, you want to to apply to the to the program that you're currently interested in, and later on, if you decide to change, talk to your directors. And I'll just uh, say at Duke, because our curriculum is such, you do your clinical year before you start your PhD. Oftentimes students come in thinking they wanna do one thing and our, their clinical year sort of changes their mind about things. So 
Um, I do like the part about having a story about why you've done what you've done and where you think you want to go. But we are also open to, you know, if you change your mind and you go a different direction, that's all part of our process as well. So um, not a bad thing necessarily. So I'll just add uh, two things that our program that provide flexibility. Uh, one is that uh, uh, most of our students come in under an umbrella uh, admissions program for the graduate training where there's six different programs, uh, you know, bio biomolecular sciences programs, uh, you know, biochemistry and physiology and farm talks. All the students come in there and they don't have to choose a program until somewhere in their first year of graduate training. And then they're, they're also given the option, I think everybody does this too, of three lab rotations. So, um, you know, you can, you can explore uh, really different uh, areas and different labs um, as you enter into the graduate program. Thank you again for our panelists. So the next question is about early submission of the secondary. So one of the students asking about those, uh, those secondary submission in September and October really hurt any chance of receiving an interview invite compared to submission and a secondary earlier during the process back in July or August? I mean, I'll just say that, you know, the earlier you apply, the more interview spots that are open. So that's one advantage to coming into the application cycle. But anyone who completes a, a secondary application and has a completed application has to be reviewed and, and evaluated and be considered for interview slots. So. Everybody, you know, has an opportunity, but just remember, and this is probably for most programs, unless they're on a rolling admissions, the, the interview slots get less and less and the criteria, at least for us, gets higher and higher. So you just want to think about that as you're applying. Completely agree. Thank you so much for our panel this is for the short question. So the next question is about how do I connect with the interview? So uh, one student asking, how do I connect with the interviewer over the virtual environment? And how do the applicants stand out in this format like in, in the virtual environment? So our think... process, our, our process is virtual. Um, I, I think most people have gone to that. Uh, and you know, we, we've talked about this already is, is tell your story, uh, especially your research story. And, um, and, uh, you know, what, what your interests are, and, and what drove you um, to that program. And, uh, you know, we do love stories. And um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. I always like to say, remember, it's a conversation, not an interrogation. <laughs> you know, you, you're you both interviewing each other. Um, everybody's looking for a good fit. You want to feel like, wow, I want to hang out with these people for the next eight, nine years of my life. And the program directors are feeling the same way. Wow, this is really interesting, exciting person. We would love to have them in our program. So come into the interview with that spirit that it's a query, you're, you're checking things out. I mean, if you made it to the interview, you're rocking it. I mean, you're doing really, really well. You, you've made it to the interview. At that point is um, be able, like, I love the idea of the stories. It's about the story. We're all stories. We're full of stories. We are a story, right? So uh, be, be, be ready to talk. I mean, it's just a conversation like you would have with with any other person where, where you're sincerely sitting there thinking, I wanna to get to know this person a little better. And I would also add that I think it's really important to be yourself. Don't try to be somebody mm -hmm. other than who you are because uh, we want you to be uh, who you are today so that when you come into the program, you are that same person with, with a growth mindset. But if you're trying to be somebody else, it, you might not resonate with us once you actually come here being the person that you really technically are. So don't try to answer questions that you think we want to hear. Answer the questions as if you, it's just however it resonates with you. Yeah. I think when um, when the pandemic started and we switched to virtual interviews, at least at, at Wisconsin, there was 
there was a pervasive feeling of dread because we had we were really afraid that we had no idea how we're going to evaluate the candidates, how we're going to read body language, how the interview is going to go, so on and so forth. Uh, we actually had our most successful recruiting years in the middle of the pandemic, which was really sort of bonkers crazy. And everything that is true that you would do in a normal human interview or in-person interview, communicate, express body language, smile, sit straight up, so on and so forth. All of these things apply. You can connect with somebody over virtual as much as you can, you know, in person. This is why most programs have second visits because then the question then is, do you have a connection to a sense of place, right? Emory is gonna feel a lot different than Madison, than New York City in Morningside Heights. Come out and visit us, put your feet on the ground, smell the air, taste the food, see what you like. Um, New York's gonna be a lot more exciting than Madison. <laughs> that's totally cool. Um, I can't compete with that. But I think there's a couple of things that Madison might have that New York doesn't have. And students will naturally gravitate to those places. And I think that's why there's those sort of two stages to the interview process too. Kathy used the word fit, and that's really an important uh, idea. So, uh, again, it's it's we're looking at you, you're looking at us. And, and after the, you know, the virtual stuff is over, we send out the offers and uh, to everybody we send an offer to, um, we'll bring them in uh, to, to visit campus to, to, to really nail down that fit. And thank, thank you so much again for our panelists for the question. So the next school, two questions also about interview. So uh, I will combine them together. So the first question about the traditional interview, how do how did you tackle the question about tell me about yourself and how long should my answer go, is going to be? And the second question is about do all of the dual degree program do the MMI interview and how should I prepare for that? So one is about traditional interview, one is about MMI. So at Duke, we uh, have sort of a combo um, situation happening um, for the uh, MD interview. It is a multiple mini interview and it is five ethical stations, two traditional interviews, a team station, and then you watch a video and answer, uh, talk with the person in the room about what that video means to you. So for the ethical and scenario, ethical scenarios, some of those um, questions do not have actual answers to them. It's just, how do you think about the topic? How do you, how do you think about, you know, um, the overall uh, scenario in general? There might be uh, experiences that you have um, with regards to the scenario and there, there may not be. So it's just, how do you, how do you think about the topics in general? The traditional interviews are more about why you on this path, why why you do why you doing what you're doing, to, um, wh why are you interested in research, why are you interested in medicine, why do you why do you want to be a physician scientist, and then the team station is more about you know how do you work in a in a team setting or with someone else because we do have a lot of team based learning, a lot of uh, you know learning together, and we want to make sure that you're going to be able to collaborate with your friends and your your colleagues, even if you've never known them or interacted with them before. So that's the med school interview. When you come to the MSTP interview, we have a panel interview for the uh, for the uh, applicants. And it's a discussion about your research, about why you want to go to medical school, again, about failure. And then the interview, you meet with faculty interviewers. And that's more about uh, you getting to know the faculty that you might be interested in working with. So you get to sort of take a look at what we have to offer from a research perspective. And then you'll meet with a student and then the student will be able to talk with you about what their experience has, has been at Duke, how they found labs, what the support of the administration has been like uh, to help them get on uh, their path and, and, and achieve the goals that they're looking to achieve. So it's a, it's a lot of different things going on. So again, that's why I say it's, it's really important for you to be yourself, have your story, know uh, why maybe Duke is uh, important to you or why, why this would be a, a school that you would even want to come to. Um, know why you're doing the research that you're doing and what kind of faculty might be of interest to you here as well. And I think, you know, all MD PhD programs or any, any PhD program that you're applying to is going to want to know your research. So you have to be able to share what that is about, 
um, and why you're doing what you're doing and where you might take that research if you were to stay in the lab long term. So you, you know all about what's going on from that perspective. So again, just be yourself and um, tell your story and why you're interested on this path and it'll be great. I got one more of that one. Um, if speaking to the introverts in the crowd, I mean, maybe you feel like this idea of sitting down with somebody and they go like, so tell me about yourself. It's like, ah, it's the worst thing that you could ask me to do. But remember, they're trying to get to know you. And if you join that program or any program, you're going to be interacting with them for a very long time. So at some point, they 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 hopefully will get to know you. And, and you should be a little bit open and even vulnerable in that interview. I mean, you, you're probably going to be nervous. We may be tired. And it doesn't mean that we're not interested. We're still listening. But if you're nervous, that's fine. We It's an expectation that you may be nervous about it. So you just, just tell us, I mean, why? Why do you want to do this? I mean, it's a really good question. You know, tell me why you want to do this. And again, we get back to the stories. You know, this thing... Maybe this ha thing happened to me or I may met this person and they're an MD, PhD. And I was like, oh, my God, you can do both of those things at the same time. And you go from there. And and I mean, it's your story. So so you should you should feel comfortable in, in telling us because because even though that seems like a like a throwaway question, you know, like, who are you or <laughs> what are you here? I mean, those are the most important questions. Research is important. You have to have that handled, but we also we also need to to have that personal conversation. Let me add a couple things. One, so our process with med school is it's one on one interviews, and uh, they're going to ask you again because it's an osteopathic uh, college. They're going to ask you about your uh, interests uh, and motivations for being an osteopathic physician scientist. And then on, on the grad school side, uh, one thing that I think is pretty unique is that um, all the students who come in um, give a 10 minute talk about their research. And so uh, you need to be prepared um, to um, you know, strut your stuff uh, in, in front of people. Practice, practice that talk, not just to your lab, um, but you got to go outside the lab. Again, we, we've talked about the ability to communicate. Uh, I also like the idea of, of communicating to, to somebody who's the level of your mother um, uh, and, and make sure that, that they can understand it because your research is, 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 is everybody's research is very niche. And, and so you have to be able to talk to a broader audience. And, and then the last thing I want to say is, you know, do your homework. Um, Look at the look at the websites, the the programs, the faculty, and identify a couple of people that you might be interested in um, working with, and make sure you get them on your schedule. Thank you so much to our panelists. So I just want this. We we'll have. I just want to make a quick announcement that we're halfway to the webinar now. So if anyone uh, who just joined, I just want to let you know that if you are stepping away or if you are um, uh, cannot attend the second half of the webinar, so uh, the webinar will be recorded. So if you have any question, so our panelists any concern, you can always go back to the uh, video on our YouTube channel uh, in order to view this uh, webinar. And then if you have, I also put that in the chat also here, the panelist bio, so you can reach out to them if you have any question or concern. Um, so the next question is uh, someone asking about writing the manuscript. So if you are in the process of writing writing your own manuscript. Um, if there's a space during the interview process where we can discuss about the high and, and the low of that of that process. Well, if you're in that process, congratulations. That's always exciting. <laughs> and uh, that's a great story. That's that's a great starting point. Uh, and, you know, we love to have students that are engaged in research and and sort of it doesn't count unless it's published and and so if you're in that process you know you're doing science and and we want to know about those struggles and um you know maybe we can give some tips or something or other but but just just learning about that that process and 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 where you're at and and what it's about 
that's exciting. Yeah, I mean, and don't 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 be shy about if if you're talking about that manuscript saying what are your contributions are obviously you're writing it so that's one big contribution but in terms of the research, um, most journals now will ask you how did you contribute to this manuscript right so you should you should have a very good understanding of of what you brought to that process. Um, and and you're not going to sign like a psycho <laughs> by saying, you know, this was, I got this assay to work or I'm, I'm working on this figure because that's my figure, that's my data. I mean, that those are perfectly legit things to bring up because they are, they are your contributions to the manuscript. Thank you so much to our panelists. Um, so the next question, is, I will go back to the Q and A chat box. So there's someone asking about that. I received the feedback from the PhD research in my MD PhD, and most of the um, the professional that is, they are work, he or she working with is of, often biomedical. However, they have an interest in research in developmental cognitive science, neurosciences. So um, if there's the possibility to do research that are not strictly clinical or biomedical as an MD, PhD student, and even and eventually to become the physician, uh, physician scientist. Yeah, any tip on advice? My, my advice would be to, to exploit the AAMC website because you can learn about which programs do and don't have um, PhDs in the non-traditional biomedical sciences. So there's a lot of places that have adopted sociomedical sciences and um, even, you know, humanities and things, and some that just haven't. And it's all pretty much in the public domain, or if there are certain universities you're interested in, if you go and look at their website, they'll let you know whether they have that those more non-traditional tracks or not. So, you know, more power to you if that's what you want to do, but not all programs will offer that as a possible PhD. That will definitely be on a program by program basis. And this is where doing your research, as Andrea had mentioned earlier, you, you got to hit the web, you got to hit the program websites and see exactly what's offered. Um, if I'm selling Wisconsin now, we offer PhDs across the whole spectrum from medical anthropology to psychology to immunology so hit us up <laughs> msu is the same from anthropology i like to say to zoology <laughs> same for duke we're open yes yeah and and always you know if, if you're not sure reach out to the program um find you know program administrator or programs have an email address because you don't want to go through the process of applying and to, only to realize that that particular program is not accepting students that year or doesn't accept students at all or never have. Um, so 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 get that information up front uh, if you can at all. And as to the rest of the question, I mean, yeah, I mean, I always say, you know, if you can figure out how to do it, do it. You you can combine, uh, you, you need to bring, if you can bring those different areas together, that is a great place to be in particular if a lot of other people are not currently doing it because that shows that there's there's a gap. Um, in knowledge there. Thank you so much. So the next question uh, I would go with. Um, so after, so the one question about the ten, thank you card. So after the interview, what's the etiquette uh, regarding to thank you? So I hand written the card or just send an email. The mail system at our university is so unreliable, I would recommend email. I mean, handwritten cards are nice, but they're very antiquated, and you'll you'll be much more impactful if you do it digitally. I would also say, even though we accept them, I think we're getting to the point where we're gonna we've been talking about not accepting thank you notes. Um, I don't because it, uh, yeah, it's just a lot to to reply to and handle at the after a, an interview anyway. So. Um, but but we do, I just would be mindful of who does accept them and who does not, because some schools do not any longer. 
Yeah, I mean, I think if somebody says, don't do it, don't do it. <laughs> I mean, that, I think that's that's a pretty clear signal. If they're, it's kind of ambiguous. I mean, I remember one time somebody tell me, told me never to get in the way of somebody trying to be thankful and grateful. <laughs> so I've always carried that with me. I get, I mean, I get these emails. I may not have time to respond to them, but it's sort of like, okay, you did that. And and on that note, I was cleaning my desk this week and I found a thank you card from somebody who is now on her fourth year in our program. And I thought, oh, how cute. Uh, so, you know, don't don't think that if you don't send a thank you card that eliminates you from the running. I mean, it's it's not part of the application. It's not a requirement. Thank you so much, uh, Alpine, that's for the uh, candid advice about <laughs> the thank you letter. Uh, so the next question, I'm not too sure if I'm familiar with it, but uh, maybe the panelists will know. What's in the format for the Kira interview and why Kira interview being used? And do you have any tip and advice on how to prepare for that? The Kira, K-I-R-A. This is my first time hearing that. Apparently for we all of us. We don't use it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can skip that question. Yeah, so yeah, so the next question is about academic. So if there's any question about academic concern, then how do we address that and met it as a part of the strength rather than the weakness during the interview? I would say that if if you're you know, as Kathy mentioned earlier, if you are sitting in a program, MSTP program interview, I think you've 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 cleared that hurdle. And unless your interviewer specifically raises those questions regarding to past academic performance, I wouldn't I wouldn't poke that sleeping bear. Like, why would you talk about the weakest part of your application when you have precious moments with somebody where you're there essentially to sell yourself and share who makes you you and why you think me being a physician scientist trainee in your program is the best choice for me. So I would just leave it alone. I agree hundred percent. Let sleeping dogs lie unless somebody asks you specifically about it. And then you can address it at that time. Always, always talk about the, the good points of your application and not focus on anything other than that. So if they do ask, <laughs> then um, own it. That That's my recommendation. And, you know, uh, so we look, I think everybody looks holistically. There's no single metric that's going to get you in or keep you be a barrier. And, and so if there's a problem there and somebody asks you about it, you can say, look, you know, that was my sophomore year. Uh, my parents were uh, having go under doing were, were were in the process of divorcing, and it was a really really bad time for me. And um, you know we got through it, and and now look at you know those last two years. You know um, I, I did great. And and the other thing about you know grades is we look at trajectory. You know everybody struggles sort of early. And, and then, you know, they get their feet under them and, and you can see that trajectory and, and really focus on that if, if that, if that fits. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I, you should be prepared and, um, the, you know, every weakness is a strength and every strength can be a weakness and sort of recognize that and then use that uh, to your advantage. Thank you. Uh, thank you to our panelists. So the next question is about uh, having the uh, preparation for research during the interview. So one of the students asking that I have heard about the past student having the slide or the presentation of their research to share with the interviewer. Is this a thing or should an applicant to come and prepare any interview with the slide or the data that they are doing the research for? Um. Yeah, I think that, you know, just like I said, I, I ask the applicants sometimes if they should, if they could explain their research to me at the level of a lay person. And if they need a vision, if they come in with a folder of PowerPoint slides printed out or some digital presentation, I think of that as a, a weakness and not a strength. 
And so I would avoid that at all costs. So we do it maybe a little differently. So the one-on-one -on -one interview, I, I agree exactly with Steve. Um, but then we also have, uh, as a, as a part of our, um, uh, program when they come in is to give, is to give a talk. And so, yeah, you, you need to be prepared, uh, to give a talk and it's a lot of fun. Thank you so much. So the next question is about the, the student um, interviewee. Um, so uh, one question about when I interview with the, at the, at the, with the program virtually, is there any opportunity to meet with the current student and do these student report back to the admission committee if they have the interview, interview with a student, medical student? The answer is yes to both. Like I think most, most of our programs, we have some built-in time, you know, where there's alone time between our current students and the applicants and you know they should be able to let their hair down however if the applicant says something you know that's unusual or or worrisome and things as you'd imagine our our, our students are not coached to report back to us but just as prospective program mates of that person would report back to us need to consider the the whole thing is an interview i mean you're you're inter even though there may be a formal interview period the whole thing is an interview your interactions with program staff with students email exchanges it's all part because i mean this it's all we have we, we're trying to generate an idea of 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 you as an individual um and we, we, we have to take all the information that's available. So if something funky happens during a social or during a conversation, some, someone says something that honestly goes against our values and a student feels concerned enough to bring that forward, that could very well terminate <laughs> that, that particular candidate's success chances. Every touch counts, just remember that. Yeah. Thank you for the advice. So the next question is about the reapplication. So if I am a repeat applicant, how should I address that during the interview? Oftentimes, so yeah. go ahead. Go ahead, Andrea. All right. So um, uh, again, I, I'm going to use this uh, own it. Uh, we have just recently in our program had a student reapply. Uh, you know, they asked us, you know, where were the weaknesses? And, and, and I shared it with them. And in, in this particular student, the weakness was in their research portfolio. And they took uh, it, 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 the two years um, and, and they really built a strong uh, research portfolio. They came back and, and the weaknesses had been, um, was now a strength. So uh, uh, yeah, they, like I said, uh, uh, that weakness can become an advantage and, and there was a perfect example of that. I was just going to say, we don't ask that information on our application. So unless somebody shares it directly with us, we don't know from year to year if you're a second or a third applicant. So um, if it's something you want to share, I think it's totally fine. If you don't share it, the application is a new application. You're, you're, you're in a new cycle. So you're coming in with what you come in with. So, I mean, I consider it interest in our program, um, we, we our application does have, there is a place where people can check if they're reapplying. And, and we do look at that, you know, it doesn't put you in any different category, but it's sort of like, oh, you cared enough to try again. <laughs> I mean, that, that shows that you're interested in this. It's like NIH pink sheets, right? The grant didn't go through the first time. You're going to get a pink sheet. You're going to see what the reviewers really didn't like about it. Um, you might be so astute and like contact someone like Brian and say like, hey, where where were the gaps? Where were the problem areas? And then 
almost all, like we have a specific section says for reapplicants, please tell us what has changed between your last application and today's application to give you the very explicit opportunity to share and communicate what you might have done to address those gaps. Um, you should take those sections very seriously because those are critical because that's how I know that you can take information assimilated and act upon it. Um, and then it's up to the admissions committee to see if you know those deficiencies were addressed or not. The, the one thing I would add, and, and it relates to like one of the questions in the uh, answered section about MD PhD program versus completing each degree separately is that um, you know, this is oriented towards doing well in your dual degree interviews. But if you really want to be a physician scientist and you know, it, it hasn't come easily in the application process for you, there are, there are plan Bs that are very viable. And in other words, let's say you really wanna be a physician, but think that you're the kind of physician that you wanna have a scholarly career in science. There are many, many physicians who don't get a PhD and are successful scientists because there's many residencies in the country that are very research oriented that allow you to get mentored research and to still build a research career. So the, 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 even though our focus is the dual degree path, it isn't the only path to your goal. The other question you have to ask yourself if it hasn't been working is, is why you wanna do the clinical part because you could imagine that getting the PhD may get you to where you wanna be because there are many PhDs who've won the Nobel prize for clinical discoveries, you know, and uh, you don't have to have an MD to make a big impact in, in patient care things. So those are the kinds of things that, you know, but your advisors and things like that will be helpful for you in, in figuring that all out. Thank you to our panelists. So the next question is about, um, um, will um, when during the interview will I be asked about what is all the school that I'm interview at, and or will I be asked what is my top choice of the medical school will be? Like so, when you interview, are they be this question will be asked by another school, basically. I'm sorry, I I kind of froze. Could you repeat that? Yeah, yes, absolutely. So the question is about, will I be asked about what other school that I am interviewed at? Or okay. will I be asked, what is my top choice of the school that I'm applying for? You might be, but it's not, it's not typical. Yeah, I'd it's be surprised. Cool. Yeah, and I would add firmly that it's not cool. <laughs> because, I mean, it puts you in a really odd position um, to, to have to, I mean, it puts temptation to lie of course you're my first choice when 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 you are applying to a multiple schools that you could potentially very be very happy in mm -hmm. so um i i would i would maybe that's one you can practice and basically say of course i'm applying to other programs but you know it's looking forward to to the best program that will be a great environment for me smile i mean they they they, they should not have an expectation of, of of that level of information from candidates. I mean, we explicitly tell our interviewers not to ask those kind of questions. Yeah, that's we do. We, yeah, same. That's Zombie, are you going to have a family type of like? <laughs> the, we, that is we do as well. The blacklist question. Don't go there. Don't. Yeah, it's not fair. Thank you, our panelists. So the last question is: I know some of the MD interviewed sometimes they apply it or sometimes are unblinded to the application. So similarly, for the MD PhD, are the research panel also blinded or are the interviewer, interviewer are aware of our application before the interview? At our place, they get the interview, they get the application. Yeah, at Duke, at Duke uh, MMIs have no information, so everything's blinded on the MSTP interviews. Everybody gets the full application um, if you're for the panel or the faculty interview, and the students only get your research interest interview um, information, as well as why you want to be an MD-PhD student. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, that's another question that we have. And uh, and that one, to, 
before closing the webinar, just any class closing tip or advice for this year interviewee from the panelists, from each of the panelists. I would say I'll bite. Um, an MD PhD program is it's a long program. It's eight years. A lot happens in eight years. You're gonna you're gonna experience a lot of success and you're gonna experience a lot of failure. And things are gonna happen at school, things are gonna happen with your family. I mean, it's just a long, long time. I think many of us have used the word fit before. I can't overemphasize how important that's gonna be. You're gonna find a different community in a different feel at different programs, and that's totally legitimate. Um, don't chase a name, chase a home and a chase a family. And if you know if your family is in the research triangle and everybody you love and know is in the research triangle and you interview at Duke and for whatever reason, your gut's like, I, I'm not clicking with Duke. Then go to UNC. No, just then go, <laughs> yeah, Don't go to UNC. <laughs> <laughs> she's like go to unc right so like we would send them to medical college of you know what anyway so um find a place that you can call home trust your gut you've done enough and you've known enough that you can find a place to call home for the next eight years yeah i have to agree with that i mean you have to find a place that is a good fit for you because you're going to be in this program for a long time and it's not just a research fit don't go to a place just because you're looking for one faculty member, one research interest idea. I think that's a, a recipe for disaster. You need to find a, a group of faculty or a group of people who are doing research in a particular area. So if one doesn't, somebody leaves or something happens, you can find another uh, lab home that's of interest to you as well. Um, I think also just knowing, you know, what the community of the MD-PhD program is like as well is going to be really important. You know, are you interested in a bigger program or a smaller, you know, more tight-knit community? Do you like that vertical and horizontal integration? Do you want to be able to be able to interact with the directors and the associate, associate directors or do you want to be more like on your own and doing your own thing? So all those things factor into what might make a good, uh, a good fit for you for the program as well. So be thinking about that. Um, as you are looking at programs as well. Yeah, and th thank, you. thank you again to all of our panelists for the final tip and advice. And uh, so we are two minutes away from the end of the webinar. I just want to say that thank you so much for joining us today for the Q&A session with the program direct directors. I want to say thank you so much to our panelists uh, for being here today, attending a humanities session so interactive and so many people, including the APSA PR committee for live tweeting this session. Thank you, Kyle. And APSA virtual content for Eli, uh, myself, Salim, Anna, Anna, and also Jenny for organizing this uh, webinar. Our next app application interactive session will be scheduled on October 26th, which will be a session about uh, gap year and post back research program. So you can register on the webinar on the link that Eli will, put, will be put on the chat for the upcoming week. So please also stay tuned for any social media, any announcement, and look out for further email to register for the upcoming event. Thank you so much to our panelists and attendees. Thank you. Yeah. Good night. Good night. Bye. Bye.